So, hello everyone. Uh, you know, this uh, this slide introduces the uh, the challenge that we all face in project management. And over the last 18 years, when I actually started sharing in, in presentations that 70% or more of your projects are likely to fail, I I've been asked if this is really true. I've even had folks tell me that their projects are always successful. So this couldn't be true. But considering that the statistics are really validated by a number of organizations over the last three decades, and it's a perception of success from those that look at projects from the outside in, it's not really that hard to believe, especially if your objective in your assessment and you really think about the projects that you're involved in and if the executives and the sponsors are really engaged and really focused on helping you succeed. So even if you think your projects are successful or will be successful in the future, you notice know, 12? The odds okay. are against you. And actually, if you take a look at the slide, you can see that smaller projects probably have a much higher success rate than medium projects and large projects. That's not too hard to believe. As the project increases in complexity and the executives and the money start involved in larger projects, you start to realize that the moving parts become harder and harder to manage in a more traditional sense. Moving to the next, you can actually see that these numbers from the Standish report generate um, some consideration that if we can improve projects by a mere 10% on a successful rate, you get a huge amount of savings. In one telecom firm we helped had a $2.4 billion CapEx budget and a 10% improvement in their success rate obviously delivers $240 million in savings. That offer projects in the United States in 2014 alone are estimated to have been $250 billion in investment. That's a $25 billion savings if we can get a 10% improvement in the performance of those projects. All right. It's not always. If you think about the opportunities that we have in healthcare as an example, you can see that a project having to do with something like Ebola or any other pandemic planning effort, if we can have a successful project ready to go, if it happens, that is just a click or a trigger away, the incident that may occur can be an example of our healthcare success instead of being in the news as a healthcare failure or a healthcare challenge. Imagine the VA and the challenges with veterans and needing help and services and how that, even today, is a struggle for the VA to deliver. What if processes, manual as they are, were well documented? What if it, handled, if it was handled like a small project? The tasks were assigned and actions delivered and it was captured ahead of time and assigned to people as the veteran walked in the door. This would provide an audit trail of actions. It would get the deserved best practice attention, and it would get away from the ad hoc attention that seems to be such a challenge. Go ahead. So why are things so bad? With all the focus and attention the last 30 years on improved project management methodologies, standards, certifications, it is hard to believe that 70% failure rate continues. At this point, our experiences diverge from the Standish Group survey findings. Their research found that the same answers have been seen for the last 30 years. I'm sure we have all witnessed the top five mentioned here on this slide from their survey. Technology companies have also targeted these areas for 30 years. They've built desktop, server, mainframe, cloud, mobile, and even learning software to improve project management outcomes using the same premise of PM brain dumps. An example of task lists rolling up into deliverables with each task assigned to a person with a guesstimate deliverable date. Creating a Gantt chart, estimated work efforts that create budgets and milestones, deliverable dates, 
Each project may start with a previous project task list as a template, if you will. But is it really a template? Who did this template? Where did the deliverables come from? Are they the right deliverables? What are they, where are the time frames? Are they accurate? Are other team members really not skilled enough, as this indicates? Or is that the view of management? Are the top five really more excuses and not root causes? Go on to the next. If they and we have known about them for 30 years, has been technology focused for 30 years, why are the failure rates increasing? 48% of executives think failures are worse today than they were five years ago. 46% of those executives think they're worse today than they were 10 years ago. We consideration that the Standish Group and all the other surveys keep asking the same type of questions to the same type of people and continue to get the same type of answers. This drives the same type of solutions from nothing more than trying to solve symptoms. I like summarizing this as the following. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you always got. Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem with the same level of thinking used to create it. Maybe here Einstein is a bit more eloquent, but to my defense, he was a genius and I'm not. So going to the next slide, are you ready for the answer? We believe the root cause is experience. It's a simple premise. It takes those top five into consideration. And what we found over time is that the experienced project and program managers tend to deliver higher results. They're able to navigate the culture while delivering a project. And that's not something you can generally learn from a book. Books and methodologies are great foundational building blocks. And we highly encourage using these as that foundation. However, if it were easy to build a car, a house, a bridge, a building, or other complex structure after reading a book, then all of the supporting organizations, the architects, the planning commissioners, structural engineers, inspectors, and even licensed contractors would all be out of work. Complex solutions require supporting structures that are repeatable and continuously improved based on what we learn over time. At the individual level, we call these learnings experiences. Our brain links good experiences together to build a capability or skill set. You know, companies learn too. These learnings are called processes. And in the world of manufacturing, they're predominant. Healthcare providers have processes for caregiving. Insurance companies have claims processes. And other industries and firms have their core processes as well. Methodologies are no more than processes linked together. Well, certifications are based on methodologies and processes, and hence standard rules of behavior given a specific discipline. Going to the next slide, I'll introduce a little bit of the problems that project and program management have to deal with. There's no place to capture their experience for success other than in their own heads. When they their own knowledge uh, when they move, their knowledge moves with them. This is often referred to as tribal knowledge. Stories exist of that magical PM that never failed at company XYZ, but that person was promoted and now projects fail all over the place. You've probably seen it. You've probably experienced it. I know I have. Moving. We all know that execution of project management is based on individual capabilities and not a standard corporate set of processes or methodologies. The experienced PMs who are good at delivering projects have figured it out. They figured out successful in a culture, the nuances of getting successful outcomes, how to deal with the players involved in finance, operations, IT, marketing, 